Well, uh, welcome back to the uh, second uh, session. Um, and uh, as mentioned, we have an hour for uh, you to address questions to the panel. Uh, there are two roving microphones, so we might, uh, there'll be a sort of a temporary pause while, while I think Giles will bring a microphone over to you. Um, but um, really, the uh, floor is open for questions. Or comments, or comments even, yes. yes. Um, if there's a Nick. And if I'd just like to say, if you'd like to say your name and uh, your affiliation, that would uh, be very helpful, thank you. Nicholas R. Bastnard, I'm, I'm a student at, on the uh, sustainability course with uh, um, Professor Bannister, and it's about scale. And uh, when does it become a point where that advantage of scale in the city begins to uh, wear off or begins to reduce, or does it has it has that happened yet? Well, yes, so we'll take one question at a time. So if you'd like to address your, your question you know, to, to the individual or the panel as a whole, but uh, David, if you'd like to, to respond. Thank you. I mean, it's a, it's a really difficult problem, I think, what you've raised here in terms of when cities become, in a sense, dysfunctional. And I think this is already occurring in certain, in certain areas. I think it's not already, I mean, it certainly is already occurring in, in Many, in many, in many situations, that um, I mean, there's one thing that uh, there's a, up to about say five, six, seven million in the northern cities. They seem to work quite well. I mean, the, the larger, larger cities. Where it becomes a real problem is perhaps where cities begin to merge with each other, and there there are a whole series of issues that are are, are raised. And it's not just that you are sort of getting one city, as it were, encroaching on another city. There's a sort of physical side to it. There's probably a governance side to it in terms of how the city relates to each other organizationally. There may be sort of discontinuities in terms of the uh, infrastructure that's already there because they've been implemented under different jurisdictions. I don't think it's just a size issue. It's, 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 it's a much more complex issue than, than just size, but it's, a, it's an amalgamation of, of factors that make it, and this is happening, make it really difficult to, to, to happen. So the example I gave of, of the Nanjing, Shanghai area with an 83 million population, that is, is, is happening. Shanghai is, is, is works reasonably well in one sense at least in that it has its satellite structure and it has now uh, reasonable links with Nanjing, but it's all the other areas, uh, all the other cities within the area that are, are, are causing causing the problems. And also it's then saying, well, where is the center of that development? You have multiple centers. And this has caused huge problems in terms of uh, an analysis, is that we're quite good at looking at single-centered cities, but when they become polycentric or multiple-centered cities, it becomes much harder to look at how the structure is actually working. Thank you. Mm. Yep. you might be interested in uh, following up the work of Professor Jeffrey West. Uh, he's a physicist by training, former president of the Santa Fe Institute in the United States, uh, and incidentally a, an associate fellow of the uh, Institute for Science, Innovation and Society uh, here at Oxford University. And Jeff's done some very interesting work looking at issues of uh, scale uh, both in the natural and the social worlds. And one of the things that uh, is intriguing, and I don't remember the details, I'm afraid, but you'll obviously be able to check this up through the web, um, was that whereas, in fact, in the physical world, there are limits beyond which you start to get uh, a diminution of functionality with increases scale. His argument, at least, is that you don't find this uh, with urban development. Uh, now, that's obviously a contentious uh, finding, but uh, uh, it, it's one that he has researched quite extensively and, and would be interesting for you to look at if that's a topic that intrigues you. in the panel's views on... I'm sorry, I can't hear. Can you talk right into the microphone? So yeah, is that... That's okay. better, thank you. I'd be interested in the panel's views on achieving carbon reduction targets as we're signing up to at the national level, whether they're likely, how, how we could make them more likely, bearing in mind problems with path dependency and social and lifestyle 
behaviours that we have. Well, I, I'm willing to have a go at that because I, mm. I think I have a controversial position. Uh, personally, my view is that the uh, carbon reduction targets that are embodied in the Climate Change Act uh, are nonsensical. Uh, and I think uh, uh, simply to attain them, to put us on track uh, over the next 10 years, we'd have to be building something like 15 nuclear power stations a year uh, for the next 10 years to get onto that, right tra that trajectory that's laid out uh, in the Climate Change Act, that clearly isn't going to happen. Nothing near that is going to happen, in fact. Um, I've long been a critic of the idea of targets and timetables uh, for uh, uh, dealing with uh, climate change, uh, despite the fact that I've also, uh, for an equally long time, regarded it as a very serious uh, problem and challenge, so I'm in no sense a climate change denier. Uh, but I think it's much more important to uh, f pursue policies um, which establish the direction of travel for both mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and incidentally for improving adaptation to the inevitable climate change that's going to happen than it is to set targets that you can't possibly uh, conceivably reach. Um, with respect to uh, energy, I think that we need a massive investment in energy R&D, uh, particularly in the demonstration, develop, demonstration and deployment uh, rather than the initial front-end research and development. Uh, we need this for a number of reasons, which is that if we are going to have any sort of significant large central, uh, central generation, and Malcolm was suggesting that perhaps we could move away from that, but I think that's not going to happen rapidly and it's not going to be universal. There are certain systemic gaps in our current technology. For example, we do not have integrated grid storage for intermittent generating sources. Um, we don't have good ways of storing power from windmills and uh, solar generators uh, when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining. At the moment, we do things like pump storage, where we pump water up a hill and then let it run down through a, 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 t a turbine. Uh, this is not an efficient way to deal with these things, and it's not something that's highly sensitive to the needs of the grid. We need to be looking at smart grids as well. These are missing bits of technology. And even... Uh, with the bits of technology that we do have, and we do have some of them. Uh, solar cells have improved, uh, I think Malcolm would agree, mm. remarkably in the last, uh, last few years, um, but they're still too expensive. And the notion that somehow or other we're going to drive people into buying very much more expensive kit by imposing uh, cap and trading systems to put the prices up, uh, I think is mistaken. If we look at things like the history of the fuel escalator tax, we look at what has happened in France. We look even at Bill Clinton's, um, his picture's on the wall over there, he's probably wincing, uh, mm -hmm. attempts to introduce even a five cents a gallon gas tax in his first term of office, um, and we saw how those failed. We're not going to get people to start changing their behavior unless we can bring the cost of the alternative te technologies down to something which is at least in the ballpark of being competitive with what we have. At that point, you can increase your carbon tax to try to um, accelerate as part of the end game accelerate the pace of the switch to the alternatives, but the notion that we're going to drive this at this front end um, uh, by high prices, I think, is also misguided. Uh, just finally on adaptation, uh, I think uh, uh, we have... Adaptation was for many years a dirty word. Um, you could, it was a bit like talking with Southern Baptists in the United States, where I used to live, uh, about sex education in schools. Uh, it was a bad idea because you'd encourage the kids to think it's all right to go on doing bad things. Uh, but I think if we look at things like uh, the Hurricane Katrina event, uh, which, by the way, there's no evidence that that was uh, caused or exacerbated by climate change, no matter what anybody might assert, uh, but what it does show is, in fact, how poorly adapted, even in the, uh, the well-developed world, uh, we are to deal with the consequences of climatic variability. And it seems to me that we should be putting a lot more effort uh, into uh, improving the adaptive capability of cities, uh, going beyond things like the Thames barrier uh, for the cities in the developed world, and thinking about how we're going to protect vulnerable populations in places like Bangladesh, where, by the way, the Bangladeshis import rubble. They import other people's demolished buildings because they don't even have stone to build roads. They're not going to be building massive barriers against sea level rise or going to be able to, to elevate their ground level. So we've got to become much more attentive, I think, uh, uh, to how we uh, protect our cities against existing climatic variability, which, by the way, will also enhance 
our capacity to deal with longer term climate change. Yeah, I mean, I'd add to that. I mean, uh, in the sense that it's probably a developed and a developing world dimension to this as well. I mean, the carbon reduction targets is something that is very much in the developed world uh, uh, sort of conversations. It's not in the developing world. We, I've been talking recently with people even in South Africa and places which is, is, is in a sense really advanced. It's not even on the agenda there to actually talk about carbon. They're not interested in carbon. They don't really know what carbon is and to actually then have a reduction target. So my guess is that it's very much a first world. It's very much a rich uh, country, rich cities in uh, thing. And also that uh, Steve's talked about the supply. We must look at the demand side as well in the rich cities to look at ways in which we can consume less and consume more efficiently than we actually do at the present time. So it's not just the sourcing of the energy and things, it's the way in which we actually use that energy. And that comes back to this interface between technology and behavior and how can we bridge that gap between what we should be doing in one sense and what we do do in the real sense. And that's where there seems to be a great discontinuity and that perhaps is where we need to be investing a lot of research or a lot of thinking as well. Well, yeah, just to follow that up, I, I am, the major change I think that's happened in applied mathematics in my career has been the switch from having its most important interface with physical and biological science to towards social science. And so I mentioned burglary, for example, as an example of collective behavior, which is only just being started to be, be understood in any quantitative way. And the way in which people use devices is a, is a perfectly good other example of that. But one inevitably gets into questions of psychology, which are very difficult to quantify. And, well, it's, it's, it's part of the difficulty of this interface between quantitative physical science and, say, architecture. And if I could just say one other thing, um, which might be sort of relevant, <coughs> uh, there is also an emerging interface between mathematics and computer science and entertainment. And uh, I was recently talking to the research director of DreamWorks, who has pictures every bit as beautiful as Norman's pictures, which are created by a vast team, which primarily consists of computer scientists, but also engineers and physicists. To, the computer scientists create the pictures, and the engineers and physicists sort of check them out to see that they look right, although they're never really scientifically right. And I feel that that interface has some analogies with uh, what we heard last night. So if I come back to the original question, which is about carbon reduction in transport, I think one has to look at it at, at a number of levels. Um, the first level is obviously the technologies that potentially can be used to attack that, that particular issue. And one can start off by thinking the first level of technology you can start thinking of is what are the fuels going to be used. And obviously there's biofuels, there's um, using hybridization, there's hybridizations with, uh, uh, with plug-in hybrids. Uh, with plug-in technologies for electric, and then there's full electric vehicles, and then there's hydrogen. Each one of those has a number of issues associated with them, not least of which is the resource that's consumed to make the original component that you need to then drive the vehicle with. But they do have potentials to make a, significance, uh, a significant difference, and for instance, electric vehicles have got an opportunity of go da going down to, uh, you know, Carbon, uh, carbon emissions of something like 20 grams of CO2 per kilometre is achievable right now. All you need to do is go and buy a Mini E and go and drive it in France, and you can achieve that. You, you, you take the same vehicle and you go and drive it in, in, in China, and you're running around about um, 180 to 200 grams of CO2 per kilometre. So the, the difficulty is that you are uh, needing to change the way the grid works in the way the amount of carbon goes into the grid if you want to go down the pure EV route. If you go down and look at the biofuel route, again, there's problems of saying how much uh, land do you use for biofuels, how much do you, do you use for um, other resources such as um, creating oxygen, such as creating food. And I think there's a real challenge in that area there. The second level of, of changes that could well come along is um, 
what I would call the, the, the way the whole vehicle is actually designed is, is probably the wrong way around. And that is to say, it's crazy that you take a one and a half to two ton vehicle around to carry somebody, like I'm about 110 kilos, uh, and I'm heavier than most people here, but why do we have a 10 to one ratio of mass required to, you know, to perform a function to us actually doing, you know, to, to actually deliver that function? So I think there's, uh, there's gonna be a whole move to light weighting, which is gonna make a, another substantial improvement. And that actually has a beneficial effect that things like the size of batteries then need to decrease, the amount of power source need decreases. So that takes us, as a, as a, that also helps us down that route. The third thought is to say, why do we do mobility in the first place and what is mobility about? And, uh, and that starts to become very interesting because then you start to say, uh, we've developed this weird society where we buy a vehicle based on either male jewelry type of concept, so it's about status symbols, or it's about, oh, uh, once a year I'm gonna drive to the south of France and therefore I need a vehicle that does that, and 99% of the time it actually just drives me 10 miles to, uh, for my commute. And so the question is to say, can we actually rethink the way mobility happens and say, can we actually diversify the mix of vehicles that we use in order to achieve a particular functionality. And that starts to go into a whole lot of different business type environments and say, how do you actually create the business in infrastructure to, to enable that to happen? That also then ties into the whole city side of things is to say, why do we need to travel the long distances in the first place? And that starts to become, uh, become interesting and, th and then you start to look at areas such as um, uh, using um, advanced ICT type of, of, of uh, technologies and immersive environments where you can start to have three-dimensional video conferencing and that enables you to, to actually do long distance travel in a lot more, uh, a lot more <laughs> sustainable way. So I think there are multiple routes to that. Are they all gonna happen next year? No, but we know that some manufacturers are already talking about that by 2014, something like between 50 and 60% of all new vehicles that they make will either be plug-in hybrids or electric. So there is a, a trend towards doing that. If you look at places like Japan, David will know better than I do, but th there, the size of the vehicle has de decreased dramatically, and therefore it's becoming a lot more efficient to decrease and do on the light weighting. And if you look at the business environments, you can either think of streetcar or zip car, those alternative modes of, of, the, of supplying uh, personal mobility are starting to come through. So I see there is trends of moving in the right direction. Whether we're gonna meet those targets, I don't know, but we're moving in the right direction. Another question, um, Michael? Yes, thank you, um, uh, Mike. Michael Keith, uh, the ESRC Centre on Migration Policy and Society. Um, it's a simple question with an explanation, and the simple question is: uh, how, how does the way we think about land impinge on our prospects for sustainability in cities? Um, uh, but specifically in terms. explanation, I guess, is, is, is in part about the tragedy of the commons, but in those models of the, the megacities of the future, we know that there are very different models of property rights and ownership that are being invoked in China and <coughs> the US, for example. So in China, you buy uh, not property as such, but uh, land rights or the right to use that property for a period of time, which is a different notion of ownership altogether from the one in the West. Now, on the one hand, this might be about, if you like, the end of the Washington consensus, as it's sometimes talked about, and the emergence of a, maybe a Beijing consensus. But in, in, in some ways, I suppose it's about how we think about externalities in generating uh, sustainable, sustainable cities, not just in the mega cities and the meta cities, but also even if you take something like Crossrail in London, mm -hmm. we have now sophisticated models to think about commodifying the future, if you like, through value capture, through planning operations, through one of which, and uh, we think about real estate in terms of hope values and the ways in which we can have, and I say to you,
Thank you, Michael. Um, David, do you want to lead? <laughs> Not really. Um, <laughs> it's, such a bi it's such a big and complex issue. It's very difficult to, to talk, I think, in, in generalities about it because of different sorts of cultures, different locations, different sorts of size of, of cities and things. Um, but I think one of the crucial issues here is, is, the, um, is the allocation of land between what we might call private ownership in terms of who actually owns it and the, the use of the, what we might call the public domain and who actually has the rights to, to, to use that. And my guess is that uh, if we're moving towards a sustainable city, we have to be absolutely clear who has the rights to use what is available in terms of, of the land. So in my area, <coughs> for instance, in, the, in, in, in transport, is saying that certain parts of the land would be allocated <coughs> excuse me, to, uh, to cars, and that is for their use. It might not be for the whole day. It might be for part of the day. But then it's also being able to find ways of saying that this land is for the use of pedestrians, for people, for cyclists, for other types of use. And I think this is where many cities actually fail in terms of that defining whose right it is to use that particular, as it were, right of way. Um, and thinking now with ICT and other areas is that we can be much more creative about the use of land. And if we can then transfer ownership from um, as it were, to the people who live there, the communities or something like that, then that land tends to become uh, much better used in terms of the types of uses, but also in terms of the engagement, the, the fact that it will be used for uh, play activities, for children, for all sorts of things that it wasn't used for before. In developing world, it can be used for markets, it can be used for uh, street activities, but that's not exclusively for those that type of that type of situation so that's the common but also then we have the other side of it which you're saying is that on say mega projects or on big projects that we actually have substantial value uplift and it's saying right well who actually should benefit from that that uplift there's a lot of literature around this in, in different sorts of schemes and saying how can we tie the people in to the beneficiaries actually paying part of the premium that they get from the land or property value uplift back into the public purse. So it gets round your original sort of comment on uh, the, the, the sort of the lock-in type situation, which the benefits accrue to the private investor or the private owner rather than to the public side. In this country, we've not been very good at doing that. Yeah, I mean, mm. I, I think my first observation is w w would be to suggest that one shouldn't get too hung up on the question of ownership. It's the question of the use rights and access rights that are critical. After all, uh, you know, you talked about a situation in China where you don't own the land, you buy use rights. How different is that from leasehold, uh, which is a well-established um, land tenure um, system here in the UK? We also have the situation where we have privately owned land where there are public access rights, the public the right to roam, for example, is, is, is a case of that. So I think it's not so much the actual ownership uh, structure. We can get hung up on uh, one size fits all f uh, formulae. I mean, we know the work of De Soto who said, if we gave everybody in uh, the favelas uh, a, a certificate of title to their land uh, so that they could, that, that they built their shanty on, that this would then be the means by which that they would raise the entire economy up out of poverty. I think that's probably uh, far too simplistic, and we need to be cautious about um, uh, latching on to particular uh, schemes and ideas. And I think, if anything, uh, the thing to do is to uh, to keep a multiplicity of forms of land ownership and access and management, uh, and to have the flexibility, the key thing, and this is one of the themes of our research program, is the flexible city, is how do you develop the flexibility to change land uses uh, when it is in the, uh, in, in the so social interest to do so. Um, as again, and when do you provide stability mm. of, ex and counter that against the stability of expectation that people need to make large investments uh, in uh, infrastructure and so on that is on land? And I think that that's, the, that's really the key question uh, rather than getting hung up on any particular uh, ownership regime. 
I'm not a land specialist at all, but I'm... Neither am I. Neither am I. Let's be that clear. Probably even less than you. But I think yeah. I, I just, the, the, the only comment that I'd make mm. is to say that often land in cities is, ma is designed to maximise, and it is designed to maximise for a particular opportunity, rather than to optimise for society's benefit. And a typical example is that I uh, just come back from Tianjin a while back, and one of the things I, which was very stark while I was both in Beijing and Tianjin, is there was no wildlife around, and that to me was a shock to my system. It's the first time I've been out there. I was thinking just how lucky we are in this country to have optimised our land use for both uh, economic benefit, but also for social well-being. Well, the only mathemat contribution mathematics might be able to make is to make a model for property developers, I would say, mm -hmm. which may have disastrous <laughs> predictions. <laughs> they have those. Thank you. They have done. They, they do. don't have those. <laughs> <laughs> and they make disastrous predictions. <laughs> On that note, um, Professor Tim Dixon has a question. Mm -hmm. If you speak into the end of the mic rather than over the top of it, it works better. It's like you're on X Factor. That's it. I didn't realize that because I was uh, speaking last, I had to answer every, every question first so that everybody else gets a chance to collect their well, thoughts. <laughs> but I, 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 um, I'm, not sure. I don't, I'm not sure what the answer is to this, this one, Ted. Um, obviously, I think that uh, we're going to have to, the economy is going to have to move towards I mean, not just our economy, but other economies towards investing in jobs that can be called in some way green. I'm not quite sure what that, the, the term actually, actually means, if it's in the production of you know, uh, wind turbines or something like that. That, that's, that would be part of it. Um, but where I, again, I mean, it's a, it's a broad definition. Where I'm more dubious is whether that necessarily leads to growth. And... Um, uh, and to my mind, again, that uh, revolves around if we take a national, a, a fairly narrow definition of growth as economic growth or something like that, then perhaps it do <coughs> does if those jobs are new, new jobs rather than replacement jobs. But if we take a broader notion about sort of human welfare or something like that as a measure of growth, I don't know whether there's a link between green jobs and uh, human welfare. I, I think there's... A to add to that, there's a huge issue with how you define green jobs. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a US citizen as well as a UK citizen. Um, so I do tend to follow events in the US as best I can from a distance. Uh, with the recovery package that was passed uh, in response to the uh, recent economic downturn, uh, there was a lot of emphasis in there on developing green jobs. A lot of these so-called green Why? jobs actually were specifically uh, uh, created in the retrofit of older buildings, particularly schools and other kinds of public buildings, uh, which was fine for a while, but essentially what it was doing was funding janitors to go around and put weather stripping on doors. And, and although that shows up as being a green Why? job, it's obviously Why? not a sustainable Why? green job. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's questionable to the, to the extent to which that's creating either the conditions for economic growth or really anything in, in terms of the long-term uh, 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 environmental uh, improvement. So I think we've, we need to get a lot better handle on what we mean by a green job before we can answer, begin to answer your question. Um, I'm going to be slightly more optimistic and say <laughs> that um, 
I do think that we need to make some substantial changes to the way that we use energy, the way we use water, the way we use land, the way we do mobility. And to me, I define a green job as just saying any job that moves us in the right direction to going to a far more sustainable world where we treat our natural capitals as capital rather than as, uh, as a resource to consume. And therefore, I do believe that there are going to be a substantial number of green jobs that are going to be developing. Um, I would just take, you know, for example, all the work that we've seen done by Norman Foster's brilliant practice, as I say, I would consider most of those jobs to be green jobs because they are transforming buildings to do use things in a lot better way. And therefore, we, they're move, all moving in the right direction, and therefore I would account most of those jobs to be in, in, in the green sector. I would take Steve's uh, point into account is to say that the problem that we have, especially in our type of society, is that we tend to do things by halves. And therefore, we look at what is the, the, the cheapest way and, the, and not normally the nastiest way of trying to achieve something so that we can maximize economic benefits. And the problem that we have is that that often doesn't have a long-term sustainable solution behind it. The concern that I have is that we don't go, on to go, down, we don't go down that path, but rather go for high value, high uh, uh, economic value, high social value, high environmental value type of, of jobs where we really invest in, in skills so that we can really deliver the, the, the new types of world that, that I would aspire to. Again, mathematics has almost nothing to say, <laughs> except I did notice <laughs> after recent events in the Gulf of Mexico, um, BP did come to Oxford University with a whole lot of ideas for how to use quantitative science in a much yeah. greener way than they mm -hmm. had before. Mm. Okay, there's a question at the front here from, oh, it's oh, at the back, sorry, then at the front, sorry, yes. <coughs> yeah, uh, Chris Farmer from the Mathematical Institute. Um, I was thinking, in terms of sustainability, we live in this beautiful city, which it actually has a lot to be desired in terms of the quality of life that we enjoy here. And I'm wondering uh, to what extent the panel thinks that the university does enough to influence um, uh, the local politicians and local businesses and also learn from them about what we might be able to do. And with that question in mind, I wonder if the panel could remark on what kind of sort of mechanisms uh, academics can use to engage more closely in, with, with architects and others in, in improving our environment. John, as a mathematician, would you like to uh, well, respond? <laughs> um, well, it's very difficult, I think, in Oxford, but um, I think the University of California in San Diego has, for the last five or ten years, had a policy of being carbon neutral and energy sustainable. But of course they have a great big campus, they can do anything they like and tear things down and replace them with more efficient buildings and so on. And so I think there is a great will in the academic community to do this kind of thing, but what are we to do in Oxford? I, I can't think apart from a few suggestions Malcolm might have. <laughs> so following on from that, <laughs> 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 it's a beautiful segue. Um, is, uh, I know that the university has a policy of trying to move towards a, uh, at least to do the, meet the 2020 target, so that's 20% reduction by 2020. Um, the, the challenges are vast. I mean, our, our 2050 targets is basically that the whole university, including the colleges, has to use, have the same carbon footprint as the chemistry building does presently. And then you look around, and, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, the vast amount of window, you know, old windows that we have, how the heck do we start to insulate that so we can start being far more thermally efficient? I mean, we're busy starting to do work at my college in Christchurch where we, we uh, have over a megawatt of energy, of electrical energy consumption, and we know that we need to reduce that drastically, and the question <laughs> is how do we go about doing that? It's a real challenge. One of the, advantage, uh, one of the other interesting things that's coming together is that there's a group um, starting to form around some uh, work by Arabs to say that can we take the whole of Oxfordshire to 2050 levels by 2015 and that we're looking at raising a significant amount of money to actually try and achieve that and to me it's quite exciting because as me as an academic I would say that it starts to become a living laboratory where one can actually have a look around see where the problems are bring the best brains around and even the odd mathematician <laughs> and, and actually start to say okay how do we start to tackle some of these issues and if we actually live them in the, our own buildings and look at that, I think there's a, a real opportunity for us to make some, some substantial differences. I think that was exactly the San Diego mm -hmm. 
rationale that you yeah. actually live in this in laboratory yeah. and then you get the best possible experience yeah. absolutely yeah so I, th I think it's an opportunity for us to to grasp and and you know i think we need to hopefully there'll be a nexus of people that will help take that, that idea mm -hmm. forward well, I'll just end up, I'll give you an extra few seconds, uh, uh, David, but <laughs> I'll just say in terms of, I'll speak on half some mm. of the students here, so some of the postgraduates on the Sustainable Urban Development course, the, uh, in the third week of op October, Low Carbon Oxford was launched. So there is an initiative that's been launched in, in the last four weeks, and so there are uh, students and staff, as well as industry, getting involved in the, the Low Carbon Oxford initiative. So that, that's almost hot, hot off the press, but not, not quite, but um, that's, that's happening now. I mean, all I was going to say is, is that there are loads of initiatives going on, but I think perhaps the problem is how can we join up this thinking so that everybody is aware of, of that? And I mean, there's a lot to be said for many small-scale initiatives, but there's also something to be said for how can we actually get the bigger picture so that they're all working in, in, in the same sort of direction and so one initiative can learn from the other initiative and, and that sort of thing. So the engagement part of the question from Chris is, is hugely important as, as well. And I think that is, is part of, real part of the challenge and the part that we're perhaps not so good at thinking about. Thank you. Um, there was a question at the front. I think, mm. uh, two questions at the front. So I think Michael probably uh, pitched to the post. Thank you. Um, Professor Bannister had a great quote from James Jacobs about cities being places of innovation, surprise, economic prosperity and so forth. And it struck me hearing that quote that for many people in the developing world where urbanization is occurring, that that would seem to be a hollow promise or something remote from where they are. And I wonder for the panel mm. whether, any, whether members could comment on what areas of change is occurring that is showing that those cities of the future that are being developed in the developing world live up to the Jane Jacobs promise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's essentially you to, uh, respond. Well, I mean, I think this goes back to um, what David said at the very beginning of his talk, uh, which is, of course, historically cities have arisen organically. Uh, they have, for the most part, been built from the bottom up uh, rather than uh, from the top down. And I think we're seeing some brave experiments with going from the top down at the present moment, such as uh, the one that we've been shown by Lord Foster. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, if you go into the, to the so-called slum communities in the third world, um, they don't seem to conform to the stereotype that many of us, I think, carry about. Uh, we find that there are, in fact, functioning communities. We find there are mutual support systems. Uh, we find that there are ways in which uh, uh, those uh, communities actually do, in many ways, at, at admittedly low levels of physical comfort and convenience, as far as we are concerned, uh, function very well. And I think that we need to be perhaps a little more humble uh, in assuming that we know best uh, and that somehow or other folks who organize themselves um, need to be uh, guided by us, whereas I think we could learn an awful lot more from the way in which they organize themselves. I, mean, I think some of the examples that Lord Foster showed yesterday, mm. um, looking at the, uh, you know, seriously going in and looking at the integration of small-scale manufacturing in the slum with, the, uh, uh, with the, the habitation and the sales and all the rest of it. I think if we start to then also understand what are the politics of those slum communities, uh, uh, how, do, how do their economies function and so on, we could learn an awful lot about um, uh, the transition to, a, uh, to a, a level of, if you like, higher technical and uh, um, sort of comfort, levels of comfort and convenience. I mean, clearly, the sort of statistic we had, what was it, one toilet to... 14,000, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what that means is basically you've got outdoor defecation because they're not all using that toilet. Um, clearly that's not something that's desirable. But I think in, in many other ways we have a, 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 
a lot to gain from approaching these situations of humility and the willingness to learn. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with, 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 with mo all of that, really. I would add two points, really. I think it's, um, it's a two-way process. Certainly, there's a lot to be learned from what's going on there, particularly in the informal sector and how that operates. I mean, again, in my area in transport, there is a, I mean, bus rapid transit systems are effectively uh, being pioneered in, most, in many of the cities, big cities in developing countries, all the informal cha transport, the jeepneys, the jitneys and things are things that we can actually learn from, that they have a problem and they look at it and they resolve that sort of problem. But al also there is the basic infrastructure that needs to be provided somewhere in the city, things like energy, like water, like housing. It's saying, well, how can that actually uh, be provided? And one thing I didn't mention, which I think is hugely important, is the sort of things like microfinance and other forms of finance that can yeah. actually facilitate quite small sums of money, can facilitate huge amounts of of change, so it's looking at the mechanisms by which their quality of life can be improved. So perhaps the Jane Jacobs uh, quote is not appropriate, it's appropriate for suburban US and maybe for parts of the UK and things, but not for many of the rapidly emerging cities as yet. But I would still see those cities as, sort of as spaces for diversity and innovation, but maybe not some of those other, other aspects that she was relating to, but in time, Um, if I could, uh, just, um, it's not the same as India, but in um, Saudi Arabia, it's clear that after quite a lot of thought, I think King Abdullah did decide to put a lot of money into building half a dozen industrial cities around the coastline of Saudi Arabia. And this was part of the way, I think, that he wanted to improve society in the country and turn it into a more knowledge-based society. So I think... Well, maybe, and it seems to me, I, I, it's very difficult to tell from, tell what the tribal people in the interior think of all these resources going <laughs> into cities that they never really see the benefit of, which is probably what you're getting at. But I think King Abdullah is quite a wise person, and that, that is slightly the opposite side of the coin. Just, uh, just from a very small experience that I had many years ago when I was teaching in Soweto, was that I often found that those very poor communities and slum communities had one thing that a lot of other places I, I found very difficult to find elsewhere, and that was community. Thank you. I think there was another question at the front, um, Giles, and then we'll go to the second. Thanks. Hello, uh, Anne-Marie Souter in the Master's Program for Sustainable Development. Uh, professors Rayner and Ockenden, I think both mentioned codes, building codes, um, and governance and its relevance to this whole issue. And I'm wondering what kinds of suggestions or examples you might have of overcoming the existing bureaucratic inertia, let's say, um, to incorporating new, um, new building technologies, um, when on the one hand you have the government agency telling you to cut this and um, you know, cap that, and then on the other hand you have a different agency governing uh, codes telling you that uh, you have to build technology dependent buildings. And then given that, how would you reconcile that with, with public safety um, when, you're, when you're experimenting with building renovation? Well, I, th I think building codes are obviously enormous, enormously important. Uh, one of the th statistics that stuck in my mind or factoids that stuck in my mind for a very long time is that during Hurricane Andrew, um, there was one builder in Homestead, Florida that did not lose a single roof. You know the name of this builder. Anybody want, anybody guess? Or? It was Habitat for Humanity, mm -hmm. the self-build charity run by uh, um, uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, so clearly, when they were asked, what's your secret, they shrugged and said, we, we built a code. So clearly, having, uh, having sound building codes that are uniformly enforced can be extremely important. Of course, there's also the downside, uh, which is that you can have um, uh, 
situations where building codes actually preclude innovation. Um, a very homely example, I had a friend in Maryland who wanted to build a new home with composting toilets. Uh, and he was unable to get uh, permission to install composting toilets because they didn't conform to the building code uh, and, the, and the sanitation requirements. And he was forced to put in uh, an old-fashioned septic tank in the end. Uh, the other thing is that, of course, uh, the existence of uh, building codes uh, is not the only thing uh, that I think locks us into a certain conservatism is also the question of the dissemination of skills in the building trades. Uh, I don't know if people here have had uh, the experience of trying to um, build an addition to your home in such a way that you want to employ some of the latest uh, uh, building techniques that embody more efficient uses of energy and water and so on. That can be extremely difficult because the builder wants to put in what the builder knows how to put in. Mm. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges, I think, is how do we uh, effectively disseminate uh, the necessary skills to the people who are going to actually execute um, uh, construction uh, and, and have uh, influence over what goes into buildings uh, to ensure that uh, we have uh, the flexibility to, uh, to, to innovate. Once again, we're getting back to this whole question uh, which I think is central to the theme of our program here, which is the flexible city, which is how can you create situations where you can actually innovate and change um, as demands arise, whilst at the same time preserving the elements of a community and a society that you think give somewhere a sense of place and, and a sense of value. Uh, so I think, yes, building codes are important. They can be a drawback. Uh, sometimes they contain absurdities. Um, I recently had, had a small building job where I had to put up a uh, particularly thick cavity wall and then bash a great big hole in it for an air vent to uh, ensure that there was sufficient ventilation for the, uh, the gas boiler, um, which undid all of the benefits of being a cavity wall. So there's, there's that question as well, which I think is uh, uh, whether the codes are in fact themselves uh, consistent and sensible. I didn't really have much to say about building codes, but I think if I, it would be, um, if I was going to try and answer this question in any sort of quantitative way, I'd want to make some sort of model for the societal environment. And in the Cotswolds, you try and put a solar cell on your roof and you're ostracized from the village, as it were. But if you're in the middle of Oxford in a mobile community, you can probably replace your sash windows and things like that without too much trouble. So I think it would exactly depend on where you are, but sometimes it seems to me that um, they can be so restrictive and so retrograde the attitudes of the local community that you're just never going to get anywhere and we might, not have, might as well not have this meeting at all. Nothing more to add. David, do you want to add? Um, there's a question on, this, on the second row there as well. Hello, uh, Philip Reel. I'm part of the um, Sustainable Urban Development Program. Um, I'm, I suppose I'm looking for a silver lining here around the whole issue of um, mass urbanization. I, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the following. Is there any advantage in mass for nature in terms of mass urbanization? Do you think there's a better chance of um, maintaining undisturbed natural footprint, biodiversity, fragile ecosystems with this mass exodus of people from rural areas um, into urban areas? Or are cities going to remain, will the impact remain the same regardless of, of the redistribution of, of, of people? Are they going to remain as hungry and as demanding on, on, on sort of nature as an ecosystem? Thank you. I think the answer to that depends on what kinds of socio-technical uh, systems and innovations uh, we are able to put together in order to support these urban, uh, urban forms. Uh, clearly, the concentration of population out of uh, rural areas uh, presents uh, the possibility of what's called freeing land for nature. Um, that's, that's one possibility. Um, but it really depends on what are the agricultural systems that we're going to use to feed people, what are the transportation systems we're going to use uh, to move people between these locations and within these locations, uh, uh, so on and so forth. 
Uh, so I'm afraid, I'm afraid that in a sense, the silver lining is, is the unsatisfactory answer. It depends. But I think we also know um, what are some of the things that it depends on. Um, I would also add that I think in, in, in many ways, we, we've, we do know that uh, uh, there are, uh, in any case, advantages in gathering people uh, together in uh, concentrated communities. Uh, we know, for example, that disaster relief is a lot easier uh, and a lot more effective. It's much easier uh, and quicker to reach people in uh, situations of earthquakes and, and other um, uh, events of that sort. Um, we have the, uh, the ability to get um, uh, um, other kinds of, uh, of, of advantages just from the benefits of scale of concentrating people together. Um, but I'm afraid ultimately it depends on, on, on the choices we make. Yeah, I think also perhaps it's, it's an issue of organization. I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any sort of silver lining here, but I mean, we can also look at cities and mass urbanization and look at ways in which we can get green into the city, which is, I think, hugely important as well in terms of what people actually do within the city. So some cities are designed around the sort of, whoops, the sort of finger plan where you have green wedges that come in, some have a lot of green spaces. Uh, in them, some have green corridors with them or blue corridors, so you've got water environments rather than just uh, just sort of green um, just sort of green environments. But it also relates back to the question that was asked earlier about having access to that and the rights as to who owns that or, or who not necessarily owns it, but who has use of it, uh, and this difference between public and private space and whether that's green or other sorts of spaces within. Uh, within within the city, access is hugely important. That perhaps we don't need a lot of gardens and things within cities, but we can have collective areas that we can use if we want to have our allotments <coughs> and things, and other types of areas that we can use for recreation or areas in which we will get wildlife or different types of, of, of habitat. So the city is just not is not just as it were concrete. The city is a space in which is a living space, and that also has presumably uh, benefits in terms of environmental quality within, within the city and uh, fixing carbon and various other things that can, can be done. So mass urbanization, I think, is, is something that uh, can be done creatively, but that requires institutional and organizational structures that have some sort of vision for the city, oh. some sort of view as to how that city can actually develop. And, I think that perhaps is one of the major challenges that many of these rapidly growing cities uh, face is that the, the, this pressure on space and how can we make the best use of, of that space. And that space isn't just being used for the highest value in terms of the development value, but also in terms of recreational and other types of value that people who live in that city might gain from that space. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think there is a silver lining here mm. from my perspective in that um, theoretical ecology is just uh, evolved out of all recognition in the last 40 years and we understand so much more about how ecosystems work in a, in a scientific way than we did 40 years ago and all kinds of surprising things have been thrown up from that and I think it's crucial to build that knowledge into the sort of thing this management uh, mm. that you've been talking mm. about. If we care enough about it we'll make it happen. Note of uh, positive. Is there an, another question there? Um, yes. Sorry. Yeah. 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 No, great. <laughs> well, on, on that positive note, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to thank the floor for the mm. questions, and I'd like to thank mm. the, the presenters mm. for the presentations and their responses. Um, but it's just uh, on five o'clock on the dot, so um, it's with great pleasure now. I'd ask uh, Lord Foster to uh, conclude this afternoon's session uh, with a closing statement. Do I go there? Oh. If you want to. <laughs> I'll feel strange if I've got my I back to you. So. Uh -huh. Do these? As the ultimate uh, non specialist, I find it a slightly awesome task to sum up the work of so many distinguished specialists. Um, in no particular order, um, Mazdar, perhaps not surprisingly, was mentioned again. 
And I think it's probably important to mention, um, and perhaps I didn't state the obvious last night, that it, it's not a city, it's not at the city scale. I mean, it, it might be called a kind of mini city within a city, but it, it really is um, a laboratory in that sense. And, um, and what I showed last night was really um, the first stage of a university. And, um, and within that master plan, there will be uh, many architects involved. But it does only take you up to a certain scale. I mean, 100, 1,000. And, um, and in a kind of randomness, there was one question about scale. Um, and if you take the whole concept of processing waste and converting it to energy, you need really a catchment of about half a million uh, inhabitants to be able to do that um, uh, successfully. And, and this is completely changing the order of the notes that I made, but just um, at the opening of the uh, last week, the kind of official opening of, uh, of the university, the Mazda Institute, which is totally devoted to the study of renewable energies. Um, the students who, uh, the intake of the students from about 40 nations, and there are 100 students now, and um, they have to meet the requirements of MIT because it's tied in with, with, with MIT and eventually as it expands with other universities. So anybody graduating as a postgraduate student there is MIT accredited. And as we walked around um, to look at one or two of the projects that, were, that the students were working on, one of them was uh, waste management. And this links across quite a number of the questions about governance and tariffs. Um, and a rather interesting connection for me was that um, I went on after the opening to a trustees meeting of the university. And the head of the university said, what's really interesting is after a few weeks already, 90% of the students are so into what they're doing here that they want to stay in Abu Dhabi and, and, and have the opportunity to put their research into reality. And that suddenly struck me that there was the potential for a real lifestyle changing opportunity because one of the dilemmas that anybody working in these emerging uh, nations is, is the whole question of management. So you can have um, the ruling families, you can have, they, they can be and are indeed very enlightened. So if you take Abu Dhabi, this is an extraordinary initiative. And if you parallel that with the uh, with the island, with the five universities. It's probably the biggest cultural uh, project that's ever been undertaken, bringing in the Louvre and national museums and, and, and so on. But the dilemma is that the management is through a, a kind of group of expats who are very much about short-termism. So you're lucky if you're dealing with somebody for more than two years. And these are the people on the ground who are managing the the projects, and the difficulty is that their point of reference is not a kind of revolutionary experimental project. It's what they've been working on, the shopping center down the road here, um, or a typical uh, air-conditioned glass office block, which is the transplant into. So, so I think that um, the, 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 some, uh, that the, the that the potential to link in an emerging nation um, a 
research and development unit, which then feeds back into the population rather than, than, than you know, they moving out, to an, is, is, is in a way very, very optimistic. I think it was Professor Rayner um, who talked about the importance of water, and it wasn't touched on last night. And I do agree. I think it's, it's, it's more important in, in many ways than energy and inseparable from it. Um, the idealism of Mazda was um, that you would be able to do everything on site, and it was felt to be a kind of idealistic mantra that it had to be on its own site and sustainable. Well, as part of the experiment, we discovered that that was just crazy thinking, because if you go down into the ground to find the water, to then purify it, take out the salt, um, and you discover that it's significantly more salty on your site than just down the road, closer to the ocean, where there's less salt. It makes much, much more sense to go down into the ground there and use less energy to purify the water and then bring it. And in Mazda, like in many of our projects, the whole concept of then using the gray water from you know, wash basins and so on to flush the, uh, the WCs, it's all in place, but the codes have not caught up with the, with the concept. And it does get a little bit more, and this is not necessarily a showstopper, but it does also get uh, compromised further by uh, religious um, customs and uh, you know, how, to what extent you can use contaminated water. Um, uh, and again, a lot of the preconceptions, were, it was almost like an obvious thing. You put the solar cells on the, on, on the roof. Of course, we also put them on the ground. But we very rapidly discovered that, uh, that there are a lot of, whilst it makes a huge amount of sense in a northern climate, in a desert environment, it is really quite problematical to put them on the roof. And as the technology changes, and some of those solar technologies have very, very high temperature uh, liquids within them because of the parabolic uh, heating. And the last thing you want is kind of scalding water above your head. And also, they accumulate dust. And keeping them clean is much more difficult on the roof than, than on the ground. And so the big generator is really the 10 megawatt generator. But then if you're looking at, at some of the spin-offs from these experimental projects, you're finding the potential of a 100 megawatt unit and that's more efficient uh, off the site and, and feeding into it. So it, it, in, 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 in this other crazy thing, I mean, your point about governance is so pertinent. Um, the the oil-based electricity it is, is being sold for half the price of production in Abu Dhabi. So Mazda starts off as an experimental project, and then the a kind of austerity crunch, which hasn't hit in any way as hard as, as, as here, um, does change the economic reality of that. So now the solar, which has no subsidies, has to compete against an oil economy in, in a development. And furthermore, it then becomes subject to the operating um, financial basis of the utility company, which pays for the investment of burying the services in the road because it's going to make its profit on the tariffs. So if you have something that's so obvious that you put the services where you can get them very easily and don't have to dig up a road, that makes a lot of common sense at a level of logic. But if the governance, if the codes uh, don't follow, so somehow, and I'm end with uh, some possibilities on that. If they're out of sync, I'll give you another example. 20 years ago, we did our first project in the desert, and we broke through a lot of the conventions around you know, your chosen object, which is the air conditioner, which I thought was a, a very elegant way of, uh, you know, of introducing that, 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 that subject. So what we did is heavily shaded tower, and we stuck it on top of a huge block of ice, the biggest block of ice that's ever been made, on the basis that you make the block of ice overnight when the tariff 
uh, when the electricity is cheaper, because obviously it makes a lot of sense in terms of spreading the load. That's been fantastic until they change the tariffs. And now it doesn't work on the block of ice because somehow the left hand isn't connected to the right hand. Um, other things like mixed use, um, again, uh, the codes, the values, we've only been able to do two true mixed use buildings. And in terms of sustainability, the idea of having something which is flexible, where the rooms can be a hotel, an office, uh, a residence, an apartment, makes a huge amount of sense in the way that you distribute the energy and the ultimately sustainable building is one that will renew itself over time, doesn't have to be knocked down and rebuilt. And it was a very conservative uh, city government in Cologne that made that possible. So there's a huge development there, the Girling uh, development that we did. The only other one which is truly sustainable in that way is the one that we did for ourselves at Riverside, where we have apartments above and, and, the, and, and the office uh, below. Um, in terms of uh, urbanization, I think it was Professor Bannister. Well, uh, one of our um, <coughs> advisory board uh, is here, Dr. Mangle. He um, gave this piece of paper out in our meeting this morning, and uh, he said, I, ju I just thought you might be interested in this. I've just come back from a trip. And, so and I'll just read it here. Chinese cities are redefining the scale of urbanization. In the next 20 years, Chinese cities will add more than 350 million people, which is the entire population of the United States. There will be more than 200 Chinese cities with more than a million inhabitants. In Europe today, there are only 35 cities of that size. 35 in Europe, 200 in China. There will be about 50,000 new skyscrapers, the equivalent of building 10 New York cities. There could be up to 170 new mass transit systems. In Europe today, there are about 70. And by 2025, as you point out um, in another way, two-thirds of Chinese citizens will live in, in, in cities. And that's nearly one, uh, one billion uh, people. I thought that the analogy between the Porsche and the, uh, and the VW of, of Dr. McCulloch was, was, was very interesting and accord really with the, uh, the Porsche and the VW and the heart unit that, um, that I gave a, gave a glimpse of um, uh, last night, the possibility of an, an industrialized unit that will, um, that will treat, in that overused word, a holistic way, all the kind of individual appliances. And I think that that is something that, I mean, we're working on, we're, we're, we're developing. Curiously enough, my car analogy for that was probably the 2CV. Two, the two Interestingly, I showed the Tata, and just before I came here, I had a conversation um, with Narinda, whose face appeared on that Mumbai project. And he said, you know, the problem with the Tata in India is that this seems like a great economic breakthrough. You can get a four-door saloon for 1,200 pounds. And he said, you know, it's probably taken off in a lot of cities, but you never see it in Mumbai, and you never see it in Delhi, because the, the status symbol of a more expensive car it carries greater social weight than a Tata. And <clears throat> David uh, Nelson and, and I went to, um, went to uh, Shanghai in the, in the 90s and did a project there before it was fashionable for Western architects to go to, to China. And it was just all bicycles. And he reminded me that we had conversations with the government about their move to change the bicycle to the car. And they agreed privately, but in reality, bowing to, you know, to public opinion, the car was the, was the status symbol. And I think it's very, very interesting, this whole question of the motor city and the traditional city. I, I'm, and, and I think it was, you're quite right to, to polarize that, except in the end, I think that the, the car-based city is, is, is really a transient thing. And I think that it's, uh, the car will morph into something else. And, um, and in terms of sustainability, as I really attempted to show last night, I think that the, the traditional model is, but then, you know, 
the, the, I think the big conflict with the, with the car as a status symbol in these emerging cities, I think that's, that's really the interesting glimpse in terms of the future. Professor Ogden talked about the federal building in, um, in San Francisco and its natural ventilation. And I showed, uh, I, I, I showed a performance thing last night. What I never really elaborated on was the fact that on the graph, there were two buildings, and they both have similar systems, one a development of the other. One is the Commerce Bank um, in, um, <coughs> in Frankfurt, and that was the first building, with the gardens, the opening windows, natural ventilation. And the development of that is the, as it was so-called, uh, Swiss Re, popularly called the Gherkin uh, since. And on the graph, the, uh, the Commerce Bank is, is a higher performer than Swiss Re. 